You are listening to the Beastie Bitch Podcast, presented by Painless Podcasts. Hey, this is Desmond Bishop, a.k.a. Beastie Bish. I would like to tell you about the Beastie Bish Foundation. My foundation is geared toward the betterment of our youth. After all, the children are the future. So I've decided to dedicate a portion of my life to help make other less fortunate kids' lives just a little more fulfilling. I'm a firm believer that whom much is given, much is required. To find out more about the Beastie Bish Foundation, visit my site at desmondbishop55.com. Welcome to the BC Bitch Podcast. Uh, my guest today is former police chief John Carley of the Vacaville Police Department, um, who actually who happens to be my neighbor. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I, I wish I can describe the setting to y'all, but it's it's, it's very zenful. And for the people <laughs> who are watching, you get to you get to kind of see a little glimpse of it. Um, but uh, thanks for thanks for um, joining me on Absolutely. this podcast. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, taking the time out of your day. Um, so I, I love I love stories, right? I love I love stories um, to convey a message and how things like started. So for you, like, how, how did you how did you become um, or how did you get into law enforcement? Like in the first place, what was the story? You know, I was hanging with my friends and something that. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, I. Uh... It was sometimes a little planting of a seed when you're young. And in high school, I took one of those career tests, like a lot of people. Hey, what are you going to do in life? And I didn't really have you know, parents that encouraged me to go into college. And so I, I was really charting it out on my own. And lo and behold, one of the three things that said, hey, you might be good at this is to go into public service and law enforcement. And I didn't really check the box then. Um, I got married to my high school sweetheart, and uh, at some point early in our marriage, I think I was about 22, she looked at me and said, what do you want to do with your life? And uh, like someone who truly knows what they're doing, I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Just working working to make uh, ends meet. And uh, she knew that that was one of the things that was on my list. And I came across an opportunity because of all things coming to Vacaville for a funeral of a family friend of my wife. And in that moment, I came over here and met someone who uh, became a lifelong friend of mine. I didn't know it at the time. And uh, we had dinner and he said, what are you doing with your life? And I said, I don't know. And he was a police officer here. And he said, after a, you know, a few good conversations, he said, you know, you ought to be a, you ought to be a police officer. And I remember leaving that night and thinking, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I I want to do something where there's purpose and meaning and fulfillment. And I saw that in him. And since the assessment said I might be good at it, I I had the full support being married to just jump all in. And uh, I would say the rest is history, but there's a lot of water under that bridge. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's that's, that's an interesting story. So uh, it's almost like... uh, uh, a cl- not a cliche, but it's kind of like you you were born to be um, a law enforcement. It was like seems like it was just like a personality trait that that um, led you into this field. Do you do you think that's true with most cops, or is it something like because it, it off the top it it doesn't seem like a career is like something like oh I just want to put my life on the line just for you know for the sake of it. Like is it? A, a certain personality trait of a, of a cop or what do you, what's, what's your take on that? Well, I can, I can speak, I think about me and that is, I think the personality trait of, of people who want to, to give, to give into service, think of the military. Mm-hmm. A lot of times people believe that they want to be part of something that's bigger than themselves to the cliche. Mm-hmm. I want to help people. Yeah. <laughs> so you hear that with people and the reality is, is you know when you do good to people and you do good for people, that there's a reward to it. Because it's not necessarily across the country a high-paid profession or it hasn't been over the years. But it does drive something within you that says, yeah, I want to do this. And um, having been in it now and concluded 32 years, it's not for everyone. And there are those that really should be in the profession. And there are those that very well should probably do something else that really suits them better because mm-hmm. you really do have to um, you have to like people 
And you have to believe that you're somehow making a difference. And that has to drive you on the inside. And there are those that will get into it because maybe their parents were in, you know, public service with the military, police, fire. And so they feel like uh, they're led to do that. And I have actually hired young officers who thought that only to go through the training. And then halfway through a, a training, quit. Yeah. And instead of being angry, I th- they probably figured out it's probably best they didn't do it. So it just depends on people. But if uh, anyone who likes serving, it does have a reward to it. Not every day is good, yeah. but it does have a reward. All right. Interesting. Interesting. Um, you're, you know, this young officer on the force. What 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 was that experience like being, you know, the, the, the first experience you, you passed the uh, whatever exam you need to pass and it's like your first day on the job. What, what was that experience like? Well, it was intense because uh, at the time it was about a half a year training. And then what happens is you have to go train for another half a year intensely each and every day. And so the sense of you don't want to make a mistake because there's so much to know. You got to know all the laws and all the policies. And then you end up going in people's lives and in their homes. And it's pretty intense if you're not trained to do it. So part of that is the whole mentoring process. But I'll never forget uh, the day that they gave me the keys and said, you have passed the the training. You've passed the field training. Go protect the city of Akima. And I thought, now what do I do? (laughs) And you realize real quick, the dispatcher comes over the air and uh, just resort to the training. You need to get to a place, there's a particular type of call you have to go to, whether it's a family issue or a traffic issue. And um, I'll never forget the thought of is I can pull out and, I'm, and I have the power, but I also have the responsibility and the authority. And so for me, it was a bit overwhelming just because of who I am. Um, days, there are days that were exciting and there were days that were scary. And we live, we live in a, in a world where there's aircraft. <laughs> we are outside. <laughs> right. So in the flight flight path of a lot of people who enjoy a beautiful sunny day. Right, right. So if you hear that, yeah, that's, that's okay. what that is. That's okay. You're it's right. okay. It's a, it's a aircraft. Um, yeah. And, and so do you, do you remember your first incident on the job where, um, or if you had this experience where, where your life was on the line, it was, it was a, it was an intent, something that you can share? You know, there's a lot of different things that I can think of. Um, I'll probably in my life, since I didn't journal and I should have, that I'll forget more than I'll remember. But there are there were moments, especially when I was a canine handler, loved having a dog. Yeah. Everyone loves having a dog. They pet the dog. And it was actually a trained dog, so it actually listens. <laughs> um, but I remember going into um, an attic because of somebody who was wanted and uh, here in Vacaville thinking, okay, I've got a cover officer and I have my police dog. And imagine putting a 100-pound dog in an attic. And it's usually because it's for, for safety. It just so happens to be this this person who did have uh, warrants um, had a machete up in the attic. And so I'll never forget how my life in that moment, uh, when I got out of that attic, I thought this really could have ended everything right now. I, and I never lost sight of the the enjoyment that I had, but how dangerous it could be at times, and it may not happen every day, week, or year. But when it does, it gets your attention because we. I realize that we do put our lives on the line when we do go to the call that we don't know the outcome, mm-hmm. and it's a different world when you're having an afternoon conversation with friends and who've never experienced this to go. How do I relate to the fact that I have a family and I have kids? And I just had a guy raise a machete on me. And uh, we took him into custody. And, and there was, you know, at that particular, you know, there was no shooting or anything. But, you know, the, he did get bit by the dog. And it's really just trying to understand to follow all those procedures for safety. But at the same time, I was never guaranteed that I was going to come home. And that always concerned my kids growing up. They always worried whether or not I was going to face danger and if I was going to be okay. But here I am 32 years later, and I would say I'm fortunate enough to have some you know, the, the emotional um, stuff that comes with it. But um, there's a lot of officers that, that lose their life over, over the sacrifices. But a lot of interesting stories over the year that you, know, you never know when you're going to put your hand in a, in a bag with a rattlesnake. Or I've seen a lot of things in my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I can imagine, it's, you know, being a, being a police and patrolling, you know, a, a city 
and I'm sure you've probably seen so many different, you know, things um, in your experience. Um, um, so, so really, the the, the hard questions. Um, I think uh, I think it's important that we that we that we touch on and that we get a, a perspective from a person who you know been been in in the field, been what, what we would call ten toes down. <laughs> um, <laughs> What um, I think it's clear that there's a, there's something going on between uh, law enforcement and the black community. Um, and to, it seems to me to be clear that there's uh, uh, some kind of bias, right? For example, like you can see a, a white male um having a gun, just committing murder, and many times he's just apprehended safely. Where and then on the other hand, you can have a, a black kid or a black person who's unarmed um, but gets murdered. Is from your perspective, is there any justification for that? Like is there some insight that regular people who've never been in law enforcement don't have that you can shed a light on or is it or is that just a clear problem and well we're talking about a conversation that is uh, it's really important to have um, in any community but really across the country there's no doubt I don't have the answer for every scenario because every every incident that gets uh, painted with a with a, I don't want to say just entirely a broad brush, but what are the facts in that case and what can we learn? And that's part of the things that I've always focused on is, is there something that, that is truly in the evidence and the data of all these events? Or as a society, do we take a particular one and we magnify it and then we amplify it as if that's what's happening in all of them? And, um, I, there's no doubt that when when an incident occurs like that, then you also have to look at there's 18,000, I mean, 18,000 police agencies in this country because we don't have a national police force, and nor would this country likely ever go in that direction like some countries. So policing happens at a community level, mm -hmm. and yet the standards happen at a state level. So there's no national standard for hiring. There's no national standard for training. And, uh, you know, I've employed officers, one in particular who came from Canada. Very, very different. And it's like, how can we learn from a society that potentially has race issues or bias issues, but is different with standards and training? And can we develop things that make us better? But the only thing I would say is, is to the individual, and I've had a lot of times to sit with families and say, tell me your story. And maybe there's things that we can learn from it because in a particular case, that may be the case that it happened. But overall, I had the chance to spend an afternoon with, with Dr. Roland Fryer of Harvard. Uh, he may not remember me as an individual, but he certainly was a presenter in Washington, D.C. about looking at bias. And uh, so I very much focused in the last, you know, seven years in, as the chief of police on what can I do? Because there may be an issue that occurred in a different state, and we can talk about any one of those in the details. But then ultimately, having to know whether or not bias played a role in that individually or, as someone would say, across policing altogether. And I think that to the, the data doesn't suggest that, it's, that there's a blanket bias in the most extreme situations like a shooting, but that doesn't take away the way a person feels. You know, if a person feels like that's the case, I can't change it. All I can do, and one of the things I would do as a leader in a community, as the chief, is to say, I need to invest in what a community needs, the relationships within, let's say, the black community. And I always, you know, I try not to, um, to try and force a person to change their mind. But when you get to know a person, like if somebody truly knew me, it's, I bet you didn't know that when I was in high school, I lived in Southern Georgia 
in a town that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. marched on. And I was bust in, in what was the, uh, the, the whole busing issue of trying to uh, get rid of segregation. So I lived across from a school that was predominantly white and bused to an inner city in Albany, Georgia for a year that was predominantly black. And I made some of the most amazing relationships and friendships and to see a different perspective. And that's, that's I think, what's missing in society is, is to, to have an understanding of, of, of diversity and perspectives. But what you said is true. Perspective and perception are everything. So if the perception is that that's the case, if it's, if it's based on emotion, I can't change it. But if we can step back and look at facts and data, we might see that there's uh, there's root causes to some things, and then there's some things that I will wholeheartedly admit that law enforcement needs to change. Law enforcement needs to be better, and I had no problems telling leaders, including the president, what I thought needed to be done. And so, I'm an advocate of best practices. I'm an advo advocate of of um, perpetual improvement. I've always done that, but I believe that that was one of my main responsibilities as chief is to see what I can do to make things better. Sure. Um, I do, I do believe in, in, in within the black community, we have these conversations uh, a lot. And uh, at what point does perception um, become like, all right, this is fat. There, there's a pattern. And and for us, we 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 see the pattern. And and, and so right, two thousand fourteen, uh, Mike Brown was was killed, and that was it was made a national, you know, a national thing, and it got a lot of uh, got a lot of publications, and uh, the, it, it forced the world to have start having these conversations. But as um, but as a black person, you know, from from uh, inner city of you know San Francisco. We've seen we've seen it before. Like we see we've seen these things happen before. Cell phones could could capture it. Um, it was already a it was already it was already a stigma to us. You know the the relationship between us and the, and the police. Right. Uh, for example, I was driving uh um in I just met my wife um Indian America from. From from suburb from suburban you know United States, and um, I was riding with my dad, uh, me and my brother, and she was in the front seat. And uh, you know, like when you see the cops, there's a there's a certain uh, tense you get, right? It's like, oh shoot, the cops! Like every, nobody move, you know. You want to stay under suspicion, and uh, and and she didn't understand what we were doing. She's like, "What's what y'all doing? Like, what, what's going on?" And um, the cop ended up ended up pulling us over, and and we were like, oh man, like we we kind of you know understood. And, and in our minds, we perceived that okay, it's three black guys in a car with a with a woman who looks who could probably look past as you know white or something. So in our mind, our perception is all right. They pull in, they want to know what's going on, mm -hmm. and and obviously to us, we're uh, upstanding citizens. So. Um, you know, we, we understood that just comply, um, and nine times out of 10, you get to go home. Um, and so, but, but she was upset. She was like, why did he pull us over? We didn't even do anything. And, um, she, it was actually her car. So she reached in the glove compartment as a cop was walking over to, show them, you know, like, I'm going to show them my license and my, you know, she had that kind of attitude. And we were like, don't do that. Stop. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Right. And she was like, I'm getting my insurance or whatever. We like, you better close that thing. And like, no. And so, and this is, this was, you know, maybe 2008. Like, this is years before Mike Brown or years before all of these cases. So, we we understood or we have a different understanding of or relationship with law enforcement to the to the point of i think it's past perception when that sort of even though it is in the feeling it is an emotion 
I think it comes from a place that that's rooted in more than emotion. It's rooted in actual fact. Like we, you know, we see, like we've seen it. Um, and it, with my, even with my dad, like, um, um, and, and people listening, as you can go to my Instagram and kind of see the story. I was doing like a documentary on them because I think it's important that we, um, just, uh, on the side note that we just, the people that we love in our lives that we, um, make videos of and get their stories. So, um, the stories can be, be passed down the good and the bad. Um, but anyway, so my dad had a situation where, um, you know, he, he was, you know, wrongfully shot by the police. And, uh, so, and this was in, I think I'm going to say 89. Okay. But so, so my relationship, um, to, to that is, is, is a little bit more stronger, um, than most, than most people. Um, so when Mike Brown and, and all of the many others who, who, who were killed and it's, it's like, we, we already knew, like, we already knew that this, this element was already brewing. It's already, it was already happening on, on a level. Um, so, um, again, like what, at what point, um, do society, everybody like, yo, this is, this is, this is something, something is wrong here. Um, and, 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 and it, and you could, it obviously is numbers, right? It's, you have a certain amount of citizens, you police a certain amount of people. And all right, uh, you know, you can, some people can say, all right, it was only maybe one black person killed and it was, you know, three white people killed, but it's like, all right, how, what's the population, right? So you can start playing with the numbers and stuff. But I, I'll come from the stance of almost if, if one unjustifiable killing happens, then it's, 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 that's too many. That's right. And at what point um, do society as a whole um, implement just just better police reform? Or um, I, I have another theory. What I think is the solution, and I think we can get to that later. <laughs> but um, like, what? Okay, if you were if you were the president, or if you had the power to to change police reform, however you see fit across the nation, what, what would you do? Like, how would you, how well, would you, what would be your solution? We're, we're opening up <laughs> a big box here. But, but the truth is um, how we hire, you have to look at uh, policing won't go away. And I think this last year, what we saw is this, this uh, raw emotion across the country that took it beyond what it was five years ago from is there implicit bias and how do we instill and instruct good um, good policing one that understands and values all people it has nothing to do with race religion or anything so you you have to be able to look for what that is and so in the wake of everything that happened in 2014 uh, fast forward the next couple of years and you get to mid 2016 and um, we had some high profile police shootings. And for whatever the reason, the backdrop of, of what they were, uh, we, with Ferguson, there was an, an eruption of this country of trying to figure out across the board what's going on in this country. This country is evolving. And this country, um, I used to travel a lot and speak a lot and uh, go to states and wonder. And as much as someone would say, is there enough training? Well, there's some states that even to this day, you could go out on the street and uh, before even having a police academy, be policing um, in a community. And you're thinking, how is that possible? And it's because we don't have national standards. And so I'm a strong advocate of a very um, high level, high standard for policing. And, um, and that's just not there yet. And so if I had uh, the, the ear to the president, and uh, I did on one particular day have the ear to President Obama, and that was in the wake of uh, Philando Castile and uh, Alton Sterling. It all happened when I was at, uh, back at the White House, which was really looking at best practices in policing. And so as a chief, I had I've been very innovative in trying to implement what is best. How can we improve? Well, that just rolled into 20, you know, within 24 hours, we're watching 
officers being killed in Dallas. And so you've got the pressures and, and the tensions on, on all sides. That which is, you know, law and justice, and that is as a sense of uh, injustices that are occurring. And um, we're stuck in, in a world right now, and I even told President Obama this. I said, we live in this world where we're reduced to, you know, two you know, dimensional you know, images and six second sound bites. And yet you got to unpack what happened. Why did it happen? And you have to have both percep your perception of something that occurred and also perspective. And, um, and I'll challenge the status quo in policing, but you also have to, we have to challenge the status quo in our society and saying, you know, what is wrong is wrong. And there is no excuse for the mistreatment of anyone based upon anything including race, especially because of this nation's history and how you might look at this. And it's wrong. The moment we do that, though, then we have to do the way I think, and that is, is as a chief of police, what is my responsibility other than keeping a community safe? And that is, is to continuously advance best practices. But I can't say that we're there across the country. And um, there is a difference between... What you can do in a very, uh, what I would say, say a mid-sized agency, it doesn't make it perfect, but you can advance change a lot faster. You can change culture, which was part of you know, my vision is how do you change not just the culture here, but in the whole profession. You have to identify what you're looking for. You have to hire from the community, but you have to hire with high expectations. And so we do need national standards. We don't need a national police force. We have to have ways in saying to anyone in society, we believe in our justice system. But it goes beyond the policing or the law enforcement side. It's the, it's the criminal justice side that has the, the courts, the prisons, the juvenile justice system, the mental health uh, challenges that we're, we're, we're facing, and, and all the things that are placed on law enforcement, which is how we end up having conversations about do we defund the police? Do we replace the police? The reality is, is um, under their, a prior administration, the 21st century policing model was really designed to look at what is what, what do we need to do? And under uh, President Obama, that is the national call where, strangely enough, you talk about stories. It was my 50th birthday. Imagine tomorrow being my 50th birthday. And we had just had the high profile uh, killing that occurred in the death in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And that was on June 6th, um, and then the week of June 6th, 2016. Excuse me. Yeah, in 2016. And uh, as I, uh, I got up that next morning, it was the day before my 50th birthday, and I'm teaching at the police academy procedural justice, trying to increase the standards. And, uh, and then I got a call and an email from an aide at the White House that said, can you meet with President Obama tomorrow? Now, first and foremost, okay, I thought I was being punked. Right? <laughs> Who's going to call me? Tomorrow's my 50th birthday. I have a party to go to. Is this really real? It turns out to be true. And I, so I catch a flight and uh, I spent the better part of the next day uh, with the president. And there's a little over 30 of us that were there and some of them were those who were activists, some that were in law enforcement, some that represented uh, police unions or leadership and city. There was governors. There was a, just a myriad of people. What are we going to do in this country? But the focus then was different than now, and it was how do we improve and reform? And, uh, and that's one of the things that I wanted to focus on is how can we do these best practices? To your story, um, Policing has evolved tremendously since I started. I look back to the 80s, imagine the 70s, imagine the 60s, and some of what this nation saw in law enforcement. And so when we hear the term bad apples, okay, yeah, there's always bad apples in every profession, right? But the profession itself, when you also have to say that there's inherently good people doing good work, we need to have good processes. So there's room for reform. We just have to be willing to acknowledge when things aren't right, let's fix them. And uh, we saw a significant amount of that around George Floyd. That, that, that wrecked this country.
not in necessarily um, a way that is productive, but it certainly got everyone's attention, right. and myself included as a leader. It was yeah. horrible what I saw. Yeah. And would they say like the the the, the rioters? That's just the, the the language of the unheard. You know, I think uh, um, you know, and you can debate. Uh, you know, whether writing is good or not, um, um, you know, I think is sometimes is necessary in, in my opinion, in the way that I see it. it even sometimes it takes doing, um, um, wild acts to, to, to get people to, to talk and, and, and have these, uh, have these conversations. Um, but my thing is, is too, like, I, I, I understand, um, just on a on a on a basic level, how the police can have evolved from you know the sixties to the seventies to the, to to today, um, but it's still I feel like it's it's not a it's not a hard thing to to do because I because I feel like we aren't really it's like we putting a band aid on a bullet wound it see it seems like and. You know, um, it feels so next week there'll be another high profile or ne in the next couple of months. And it's like, all right, how it doesn't seem like we're evolving or, or we're not evolving fast enough. This is our people's lives at stake. If it was, um, you know, I feel like something else in the world, we, we get it done. Like, I feel like the, 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 we pass bills for oh something is happening. Oh, get the bill passed. It's done. But this seems like, oh, we're waiting for evolution. And from the perspective of a black person, it's starting to be like, wait, hold on. Like, why are we, what's the, what's the hold up? Like this, we need to, we need to stop the world. We need to have this conversation today. Everybody get the leaders, whatever it takes, best practice, get the smartest people in the room and let's get it nipped in the bud. And I feel like the, the fact that that conversation is not having then that's also an indictment that it's no, there's not the, the, the conversation is purposely not being had. Right. Yeah. It's an interesting look. Perspective and perception is no different than the angle of a camera. Right. Uh, a good example is uh, there's agencies in this country right now that still don't have body on cameras. Now you might argue that, um, it's money, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It could be the perspective of they're trying to hide something, right? Yeah. Um, I've seen the good and the bad of, of cameras because I've also seen the difference of what it means to, to have rights with responsibilities in society. And so if, if I come from the perspective that I joined this, and so imagine my perspective of if we could hire, train, and equip emotionally intelligent, mm -hmm. culturally competent people who have character and of diversity. Yeah. That's my recipe. Right. So when, uh, when I left, because it's like, what do you tell the president of the United States when he says, what do we need to do? I said, well, we do need leadership. We, we need to focus on what is best practice. And all too often we look at the wrong places for best practices. Mm -hmm. So maybe your experience in San Francisco San Francisco has history of policing, and yet um, I didn't grow up in San Francisco. You did. And so from, from a policing perspective, a lot of old school policing techniques might be we have a high crime neighborhood, which also could be a neighborhood that's been oppressed, and it mm. could be racially concentrated, no matter what it is, because San Francisco is going to be very different than where I grew up in some places in Georgia, right. the concentration of, of demographics and communities are very different. But one of the things that I have learned, and if I had to share with society, is we police in general over police in high crime areas. Well, it has an unintended consequence. So imagine if, if in your world, it's like, don't let anything around that line, right? You know, going, going from a football perspective, no one's going to come through here because it's my job. I work many nights in a, you know, particular neighborhoods. And let's say in this particular community, a high Hispanic uh, population in what would be a poor neighborhood. It resonated with me that 
the, the mission creates an unintended consequence because if you're trying to improve the quality of life for people who want safety, you put all the resources there. Now, the narrative in society today might be that somehow bias is playing a role that when we think of you know, institutional systems that say we're just going to oppress, it has an argument, but then it also has to have the full conversation, which society doesn't necessarily want to have. And that is maybe just maybe police over police that neighborhood because it's high crime. And so what I try to do in modern policing is to say, well, what's causing it? And let's be surgical. If we know that there's a person that is conducting themselves poorly, let's not, let's not necessarily blanket the whole neighborhood because of one person or a group of people. Let's deal with it that way. Yeah. But we got 50, 60 years of policing behind us that did it in an old fashioned way. A lot of, you know, a lot of things we see in movies and television that's just like the old dragnet. Well, if you just blanket everything, that's what you get. So there has to be a real conversation to say, I can see how we got there. But it not, may not necessarily meant that everyone who did it was biased. That's also not saying that there's not bias, which is the reason why bias really became a focal point under President Obama is, is, is to look at implicit bias and to make sure that we're making sure that we hire people who don't have that. So I, I can't speak for the yeah, whole nation, right? Right. But I can speak on systems yeah, to fix it, right? And 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 and, and from that perspective, um, I think anybody listening would, would would logically conclude like, "Hey, that's that's a good idea." And I'm come I'm my my perspective, and I'm I don't assume that you, anybody have the answer for it. But it's like, all right. I mean, I think you're pretty smart, right? I, I'm pretty smart. Well, I appreciate smart. that. I do <laughs> like. If we can figure this out, sitting yeah, right. in a little <laughs> made in a resentful backyard, <laughs> like then the people who 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 really when you're part of it who put put um, money and, and, and resources behind this level of thinking, then we it, we we should be we should be we should be better by now, right? And, and it's not. Resignate. Yeah. So, so, um, is and training is a big deal. Yeah. So, so, it, it, and, and I, maybe, maybe I don't, maybe I don't have the, the full perspective of what's happening in law enforcement across the country. Is, are, are they, are departments starting to implement this level of thinking that you kind of just expressed or? Yes. Um, I would say that um, it's not necessarily happens all at once everywhere because, again, there is no national system, but there are state systems like here in California and a lot of states would have a, um, a standards in, in training. like they, they call it post police officer standards in training. It's usually governed by the legislature that says this is what you have to do if you're going to be a police officer. And so these standards are fairly high in California. That doesn't mean they're perfect. But it's constantly saying we need to evolve. And so good, a good conversation might be, well, why didn't that officer de-escalate? Well, the question that I would ask is, well, what is de-escalation? Because de-escalation is a term that, that is important in the national narrative. And it's important that all police officers are trained. But it really started out of... Most of the time, like at a street level, you, you want to talk your way out of a problem, right? right? You'd rather not get into an altercation with someone if you can reduce the intensity. Right. And so to start with success, you, you can't have something that's, that's a part that's going to fill, right? And so one of the things is you got to be able to equip officers with skills and techniques and tactics. And you can say, well, this is how we de-escalate. Let me model to you how to talk someone down. Mm -hmm. So think of those who are struggling with mental illness. And this is where a lot of, and again, we got a player's craft <laughs> on overhead. Um, but this is where crisis intervention training is trying to create uh, time and distance and understanding so that you don't have to escalate something if you can avoid it. And uh, the key is in, in the modern term of de-escalation is can we translate that into all interactions in society? It doesn't work every time. Right. Because there's two people right. and we deal different with thoughts, different, different emotions, thoughts, different emotions. And um, somebody, somebody who doesn't want to comply mm -hmm. 
de-escalation doesn't necessarily work. But the key is, is when people are emotionally hyped up, if you can provide, you know, tips and techniques and tactics to somehow reduce that tension for a better outcome, that is really at the forefront of modern thinking and policing. And I've been very much on the forefront of uh, an expert in that, in that. And we need it nationally. But what has to happen is, is as a society, we're going to have to give the profession some space and some time. There's got to be a commitment. So my mission and my mes message is you can do this over a decade but you're not going to do it overnight. Yeah. It's, you hire, train, and equip people. And so that's what I've been doing is I've been trying to hire and train yeah. people with that that's, mindset. Yeah, that's awesome. And and, and with that, I, I think that that will be a great reform and um, and not to not to to pick sides or anything like that, but I, I, I do believe that us as a society, like maybe we should instead of taking like some math class in high school or some, and not, not to say math isn't important, right. Or some English class or something, maybe we should do like an emotional class where we can teach people how to like, because we don't, you nobody, and me, let's go teach it. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> well, right, yeah, yeah, nobody, right. nobody has really taught us how to, how to manage our emotions or, and, and sometimes we, we, we learn to manage our emotions in unhealthy ways. And then, Become in interactions and not even with the police, just in life. You run into somebody at the store and it, and, or at the, anywhere in life. And, and it's like, dang, this person really don't know how to regulate their emotions. Um, and that could be a dangerous, and that could be a dangerous thing. So, um, even as a society, that would be one of my things. Like, hey, I know calculus is so important, but can we just take five minutes now? Life we need skills. to go. Yeah. We need life to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting you say that because, uh, I challenged my staff when I came back from uh, D.C. in the heart of all of that tension. I said, what are we doing? If we, and I've always been, how do we imagine and reimagine? What are we doing or what else could we do? And so there's a lot of best practices here in our community that people don't realize. It. When we think of how we deal with mental health, we have, um, I've had an entire division of, of clinical services to deal with, with youth and family challenges. But our team was so creative. They worked with the school district and came up with a, 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 a course here at the local high school, safety and service in today's society. And it wasn't a recruiting tool for law enforcement, but it really was to dive into real issues and real life of how people and our young students are, are thinking. Because we're not all emotionally mature in our teens and we're very impressionable, but we have to be willing to suspend our assumptions as a society. And so, those are the, the level of creativity. But one of the things that I've often told people, because I'll walk into a room and imagine if I said that, uh, I mean, how would, how would you feel if the, I, I walked into a room and, and I was teaching a, a, a citizen class and I'm in uniform and I, and I thank you all for being here today. I said, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of the officers that go out. Remember, I know them. I know their families. Mm -hmm. I know their kids. I know their life stories. I said, I pay them. And they're really good at profiling. That, right. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, right? Um, some, I've, I've been known to do that. And here's why. Because we don't have the full conversations in society. Because, because usually it gets the attention of, of people in the room. There's somebody that I kind of look at them and they're like, okay, I don't like what you just said. Well, it's because there's assumptions that were just added to what I said. We're not really having the full conversation. I said, you probably thought, I said, I pay them to racially profile. And I said, if you thought that, I want you to know that if I find out that somebody ever racially profiles and they work for me, they'll be fired. I'm in criminally profiled. And so we use these words that are catchphrases and we've gotten really limited in the way we want to think and we've narrowed our views of, of what we believe through media and social media and i know it brings us together in, in this world that's gotten really small but we have to be willing to suspend our assumptions and say there's there's nothing good that comes out of racial profile it just divides a nation it divides a profession if we believe that to be true so the per perception might be as a, as a as a young man in san francisco I'm being profiled. And if you felt that, I'm sorry. 
if I ever came across someone as a police officer, I always tried to convey that that what I was doing was legitimate. Now, I can't speak for 50 years of policing, but what I can say is there's a way to make things better. But I also don't believe when somebody says that the entire system has to be destroyed when just a few short years ago we were really on the cusp of what our best practices are. We just have to get there. Yeah. So, so you said a few years ago, so has it stopped? Has that momentum Stop! Like, well, is you know, <laughs> it's a different regime. Or we, politics, we politics are an ugly thing, right? right. And um, you know, I as a I'm not an elected official as the chief of police. I serve the the community, and so I I've always looked at what is best practice, and it didn't matter who was um, in local leadership or national leadership. I've always just been an advocate of best practices. But what we have to do is just identify what are the real issues. And uh, we've jumped into a world of this last year, we saw protests that the police are inherently racist. I'm thinking we've completely derailed the ability of potential you know, best practice reforms. If, if, if there's a narrative that's being hijacked, it says there's nothing good from anyone, right? We see the banners and the slogans and we saw them here just um, you know, for I'm sure many people know this, but a lot of people have no idea what ACAP is. Imagine the, the, the term, all cops are bastards. And if you served for as long as I have, that hurts. Because I know in my heart, in my soul, how I feel. And so that's the challenge that we face. Is how do we get the very best out of what we want? And we want to live in a safe society. We want to be treated fairly. And, uh, and yet there is real, there's real information, there's real data that suggests that the incarceration, if you're, if you're a black male in America, there's a high likelihood that there's a lot of encounters and we've got to figure out why. And is it because the police are biased and racist or is there issues that we can address? But I think as a society, we're stuck just, just the emotional side of this instead of trying to solve it. So. I focused on, at least in my own life, how do I work with at-risk youth? How, do, how do, could I, as a chief of police, lead an organization that was really about high expectations and best practices and hire the future of a profession that looks in a way that reflects what it is that we want? We want to be treated fair and with equity. And, uh, I, I'm just, I have high aspirations, so that's just right. Yeah, Yeah, no, and... And like I say, like if 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 the entire system was able to to think on on this and, and implement some of these ideas that you have for best practice, right? Is 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 practical? Like we need it. Um, but when you when, when we talk about this from a, a systemic standpoint, it's 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 the same it's the same narrative and law enforcement are we we know that something's off we, we need reform and then when you go to the criminal it's like oh we know something's off we need we need reform when you go to education like we know something off we, we need reform um, when you go to labor is we know something is off we need reform like it's like all right uh from a black person that's a systemic problem that needs to be changed, um, and 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 and, I, and it's my opinion that if if it's not if we if we're not having conversations to on a systemic level to make changes, then we be really putting a band aid on the bullet wound. Like yeah. we we just all right, police reform, but okay, we need reform for housing. We need reform for all of these different yes. different areas and. Um, so it's, it's, it's my belief that the system was, was set up and, and it's, and it's, and it's working, right? And, and, and when I say working, um, it's operating the way it's operating. Now, does it need reform? Does it need to be better? Is there some things that can be added and take away? Of course, but the, the train is moving. And, um, and, and for, um, a, a black person or African-American, whatever you want to call it, 
it's it's my thought that there needs to be there needs to be separation um from black people from all of these type of uh, 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 systemic um, areas of human activity, and I know people will say, "Oh, that's that's the segregation, like that's," and I, I think it is in a degree, but it's it's like a marriage, right? If you in a marriage and things aren't working out for you constantly, right? It, 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 whether it's true or not, if you feel like it, right? Because I think I think one thing we maybe can conclude is that how you feel is more important than what the truth is, right? So if you to do feel it. like you're being mistreated, all right, then then you have to do something about it. Then if you don't like your marriage, then leave, right? Create something that you, you want for yourself. And so I'm under the thought that we should maybe have a little bit of separation and, and African-American people should you police yourself then like and 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 I'm and you know and I don't I don't know where I I don't know how that comes off right at, to to people uh cuz it's really thought only I hadn't really shared it until now but um like let's have separation like police police ourselves if you don't like the educational system then create one that that's in, indicative to what you want if you don't like banking let's become our own banks like let's it right because we just pointed out and this is i don't think it's debatable at this point that in all of these areas we're at a disadvantage there's something wrong that we feel whether it's true or not right we feel it if you feel it then as a as a group um why don't we have a little bit of separation you know let's let's politically separate and let's let um us figure it out um and and i think people say ah separation but I think too, right? It's it's experience and 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 really being in someone else's shoes. Like no one else have endured what we've endured, right? You can't, you can't. Like you, this is not a, a a gender issue, right? Which gender issues are very important, right? This is not a, a um you know sexual or uh, orientation like that's important and it needs to be addressed. But I think this is something that's it's it's unique to to us because we're the ones who who's dealing with it in all of these areas and have been his, historically and um and I believe that we should really do for ourselves and and I don't know exactly what that looked like uh, and, you know like I'm not saying all right all black people move to some land somewhere and y'all do y'all thing no I, I don't mean I mean just even even at, even in policing, right? And an example would be, um, we would have to find a way to hire people who you saying who are emotionally competent um, from the community, and and I think it's a, a, a person of color, a black person, should be implemented in there. And um, so, unless somebody is committing a crime, um, no, no, like. You should, it should be a, a black police force like, hey, it's a guy, he's 6'2", 180, brown skin. Okay, let me call uh, Vacaville BPD. Like, <laughs> like, you <laughs> well, you know, know it's, an interesting, it's an interesting thought um, and because I think what it really comes down to is a search for a better place, a better system, or, you know, a solution, right? right? And so this is where think tanks come together and a lot of times they try to look at data. So one of the things I did for many years as chief and still do is a chair of data sharing task force for Cal police chiefs. And, you know, as an advisor to the attorney general here in California over these best practices. Well, here's an example um, in, in the, in everything that occurred last year. And so depending upon your perception and your perspective, the city of Atlanta had protests just like everywhere else. But the interesting thing is, is having lived in Georgia, I knew something about Atlanta, and that is, it is a it's a majority minority. So the black community is is from its perspective, the black the police force is actually predominantly black in the majority. But their their data and everything tends to be 
I don't know the exact numbers, but it tends to be more consistent with what a big city looks like. And so what is the real issue? And are we, are we talking about the approximate cause of our problems or are we truly diving deeper into what is the root cause? You know, is it healthcare, education, housing, all the support services, are they there? Are they lacking? Is it different in different states? Is it different in what I'll call it the mega communities? Mm -hmm. Because the truth is the mega communities are what drives the data. So when you take 10 cities in this country, they drive what those numbers are nationwide. Mm -hmm. So if there's a, if there's a, if there's a thousand people in there that die at the hands of an interaction between the police and whatever the encounter is, as a society, what we, what we tend to do is just drop that down to demographics or age or things like that. And what we fail to do is just to look at what are the details. And we've started to look at that to say, were they armed, were they unarmed? But what really was the encounter? And so that's where, if you're trying to create and predict a better outcome, that's why I'm looking at probably the best practice model after 32 years is to say, we're not likely to separate. Uh, it's, an, it's a very interesting concept to say, what would it look like if somebody came to my house who looked like me and then I had to, I had to deal with whatever those consequences is if race was the issue. And uh, that has been, that's been discussed, I think, in a lot of think tanks and different scholars that have looked at data. And ultimately, what it does come down to is we need, we need to ensure that our policing in America has legitimacy. And through that is, is a term called procedural justice. And what you do is you have to be fair and equitable, equitable to everyone. And you have to make sure whether the system, whether it's the courts or the laws or the policies of a community, don't disenfranchise people. And you have to make sure that there are uh, processes or even like I described the dragnet that doesn't unintentionally, because if we assume that most people are good in law enforcement, and most people aren't biased in law enforcement, they're just following what are the rules and the laws. And, and you know, why is it that um, in America today, half of all murders um, in America, not, I'm not even talking about the police, are from a race perspective are black. That's not the, that's not the demographic of this country. And so that just gets to really big root issues and the police tend to be at the forefront of what's going on. And so sometimes it can appear to be the extension because now you have to investigate these things that people don't want to live in a dangerous environment. And so they're, they're having to do this. And so we just have to just peel back this onion. At the same time, what we have to do is expect the best. Right. So wait, say, say that stat again. You said of all of the murders, it's uh, it's pretty um, consistent, although it'll it'll vary a little bit. But um, and I don't know the exact demographics of the entire nation because every community is different, every state's different, um, and as a nation, um, I believe that the FBI keeps records. They've been keeping records since the forties and fifties, and I had to report. And so at a national level of reporting, somewhere around 50% of all the homicides that occurred, the death at the hands of another person, and we're talking 6,000 deaths in America in one year, was, was a black person. And you're thinking, well, why is it so high? And then when they start really diving into the data. So what happened from 2016 on is a national push to look at real good information to see what's happening so that we can connect how we feel about something that may be personal to us, a traffic stop right. versus a sensational, when's the next major law enforcement encounter that's going to look really bad on TV right. and is there correlation to the actual fact. And the reality is, is the incarceration uh, rate of, of black America is, is extremely high. And so those are really, really good questions. And one piece of that could be, well, it must be the police or it must be, but what is it? And while we're stirred up in motion, we're not looking at what is the data telling us. And so I've really worked with a lot of organizations trying to get them the data that they want so that we can get these answers. Right. At the same time, I'm not going to stop trying to be as professional as I can. Right. What, what, do, you, what do you think? What is, what is the reason? Why, why are black people getting murdered at that we only make up what 12 13 percent of the population i know 
It is, uh, man, I wish I had the answer to that. Uh, there's a lot of really, really smart uh, people out there that have tried to study, you know, what is this? Is it, you know, there's an over-incarceration, and one could argue um, the war on drugs in the 80s. I lived that. And so did it incarcerate at the federal level a lot of young black men. Mm -hmm. And uh, the truth is, is it, it probably did. I, I, I can't say for certain all those. I just know when I look at data trends, I say you, you cannot deny how the black community might feel like there's more or less in prison. Yeah. And yet um, the the statistical data on violent crime over a 10 year period, and this comes from, this comes from the federal um, repository that looks at national incident based reporting or neighbors, that uh, violent crime is the proportion is 1.8 times more likely in the black community. Yeah. And I, I don't have the answer to that because right. is it is it the home life? Is it education? Is it all the things that disenfranchise a society? And is it different here or the big city? Right. And I know it's a big problem. And it, it, from 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 a black perspective, now I can't like say all black from but from the conversations that I've had, um, like part of that is like black black black, kids, black boys and people just being criminalized, being criminalized more, and then. You know, even even with some of the stats, you say, um, you know, whatever the stat is, but it's like, all right, um, other other races of people may commit crimes, but they just they don't get convicted for it because maybe they have the money to pay for a good lawyer. And then now and then now it comes to this. Wait, the system is about the, the profit is more important than the justice or what the truth is. Like I was just doing my job overrides a moral compass. It's like, wait, like, all right, I know your job said do that, but like, 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 for example, um, the, the girl who just got shot, um, um, and I, I don't remember what city she was fighting. She had the knife and she was about to stab the girl. And she got shot. And, you know, it was, it was a large, you know, you know, debate about that. And, uh, and, and, it, and it's hard too, because I understand my perspective too, without actually never being a cop, never getting out with my, like, I don't, I don't have that experience. So I understand that, that what I'm saying is only, it's only, it's only me talking. It's only, it's only an idea, but something, my stance on it was that he shouldn't have shot, he shouldn't have shot the girl. And and like I said, I don't know law enforcement, but if I get out of the car and, and, and it's a it's a woman, first of all, right? <laughs> yeah. At a certain age, like I I, I don't Kia, think Kia Bryant was the name. Kia Bryant, right? Yeah. I don't think I like I know it was your job. She's she's have the knife. She about to she about to stab the girl and I understand that first instinct is to shoot the girl with the knife, right? Um, I, I get that that first instinct, but it's also it's, it seems like we're robots in a sense. Um, you remember? I, I think it was uh, I Robot was a movie. I think, and it was the uh, I think it was I Robot, but the the car was was submerged, and, and the the robot had to calculate who to save, and it was like I don't think I wish I remember the whole thing, but but basically the robot picked the person who. He did the numbers and his, the calculations, and he saved the person that it was, uh, you know, more uh, the better chance of saving instead of going for the like the person right. or like going, you know, for the person. So, um, and that's it. I was like, damn, I feel like we we robots as a society. If you get out and you see a woman, a teen woman, and you can squeeze, like, I get it, she about to stab the girl, but what about what if we had the mentality that, all right. What if we could do the calculation? All right, you know, I've been doing this a long time. Like I've seen people get stabbed to death, right? How many how many stabs does that take? Um, is it is it usually one? Is it five? Is it ten? Like, what distance am I from her? Can I go rush and maybe tackle her and the girl gets stabbed once or twice? And there's a chance, a fourteen percent chance, eighty two percent chance that she survives. And I tackle this girl now, now. 
uh, uh, the ch- the only person who can move their life, chances we we have a chance. But when I squeeze that trigger, it's zero. Like we like, damn, we didn't calculate that. Like, what? Where do we live? Like, ah, and that makes yeah. me think. Like, and, and like I said, like I can't judge him in that moment, but I just wish that we had a society who who thought like that. And and, and I'm, it, it's I'm just a, if we were playing poker, I'd one-up, <laughs> I'd one up you on what I yeah, wish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I wish we had a society that that valued life more than it does. And that compliance was was known because that's what the law requires. I often will say this when I was in community discussions. Once I got past the shock of the whole racial profiling provocation, mm-hmm. I want to provoke people to think, suspend mm-hmm. your assumptions and right. think. We're focusing on the approximate cause, which is captured on video. The key in de-escalation is you, you take somebody who's emotionally intelligent, self-aware, confident, and confident in what they do. So I'm never going to be able to create the iRobot. <laughs> but the goal and the, the mission or the vision in policing to change a culture is to create emotionally intelligent people who understand the techniques of de-escalation. Mm-hmm. Know that it doesn't work in all cases. Right. That can make split-second decisions in ways that gives the best possible outcome. It doesn't guarantee it the non-use of force. Right. But then this is where I would want a conversation with America, and that is, when are we as a society going to somehow figure out how to learn better coping skills, understand that society requires the police to be the, that baseline of saying, we're going to have to follow some rules, but the biggest is um, to cooperate with authority from that perspective at the same time, we, we have to value life more than we do. So the the uptick in violent crime is something that I have seen in my career. And so many times I'll hear the debate, you know, law enforcement is out of control, law enforcement. And I simply say, there's never been a time in U.S. history where law enforcement has been more professional than today. If you think so, just tell me what year, <laughs> right? Because the truth is, is we're, we're struggling with whether we believe that we are okay with the policing today, yet it is nothing compared to 50 years ago. When you think of the things that we've worked through, the magnifying glass is on it, the camera's on it, but the police today, if we were to take the police today, in general, I'm just not saying at the worst, but at their best, and, and transport them like iRobots, 50 years ago, would our society look at the justice system in its evolution differently? And the answer is yes. And if you took police officers of 50 years ago, 60 years ago, from Dirty Harry, mm-hmm. right, and all those, and put them in today, they'd all get locked up. <laughs> because it's um, it's an insane way of thinking to think that, um, that it, the police in general are inherently bad. But it's equally okay to say, We have so much better to come to do. But what we also have to do is look at these sensational events. And when I see them, I'll be the first to look at them. And I would have staff say, well, what do you think, Chief? What do you think about that? My first answer is, do you have all the facts? Because if I can get all the facts, I'm in a better position with my experience to help you understand at least my perspective. Just like... You have a perspective of a young man growing up in San Francisco or your dad or your experiences. I can't take that away. But when we can transfer from how we feel about how we were treated, and maybe we were treated wrong, was it an intentional bias or race issue? Or was it because we didn't start with emotionally intelligent people and we didn't properly train or equip them and we didn't see what it means to look at de-escalation in modern policing? And it's all they know. Yeah. And a good example of that is, you, I think you started with Michael Brown. I don't know Michael Brown. I never met him. You know, the closest thing to a Michael Brown investigation, even though I've looked at it from afar, is Stephon Clark in, San, or in Sacramento. And I didn't know Stephon Clark. I look at them and say they have a life story, and it's there's probably a lot of things that led up to the events that did occur. 
and it's it's very similar to how you know you think of a plane crash. You know, nobody wants a plane crash. The one thing, and I've been in in a summit in 2017 that looked at high hazard professions, and I represented and I was part of one of them. They looked at Harvard from the medical side, looked at the NTSB from traffic safety and crashes, and representatives of NASA. And we're all high hazard professions. But the one takeaway that I had was policing in America is the only one of those, if, we, if we're just going to call them all professions, that not everybody is coming to the table wanting and desiring a positive outcome. A good example is, is nobody goes in for surgery going, hey, doc, I'm going to not fast the day before, right? Yeah. And uh, he's like, well, I'm not going to put you completely under, so just be sure you don't twitch your knee when I do surgery. And you're like, no, hold it still, right? <laughs> right? I'm not going to move. You get on the plane and you want your pilot. When she greets you at the door, you want her to, to make sure she gets you to Hawaii, right? <laughs> right? But that's not always the case in in uh, public safety is everyone needs to have the best possible outcome. And so the training could be uh, don't reach for the glove box, right? Well, what if everyone, and I've had these conversations from an NTSB standpoint, if you could dissect Michael Brown, if you could dissect Philando Castile, the traffic stop goes horribly wrong. Is it training? Is it bias? There's so many things that the police officer did wrong. And there's so many things that if you re-engineered it, well, don't reach for the glove box. Well, I wasn't reaching for a gun. Well, how do you know that? Well, the air traffic controller talks to a pilot the same way, whether it's in Chicago or it's in Frankfurt, Germany. There is a complete understanding. And so you, you, know, you ask the question, what else can we do? We could completely rethink and re-engineer. So we, we're not talking about these approximate causes of death, whether it's a Michael Brown, but it's actually the, the, the root cause of how that engagement occurs. So that a young black man in a car who does get pulled over at least starts with the concept of how to be safe, right? Just hands on the string wheel. And how do we teach a, a young police officer in the future to say when you walk up on the car, don't play games with people. Don't try to don't try to shuck and jive the driver. Like, hey, how you doing tonight? Where are you coming from? Don't interrogate. This is why I stopped you. Just what if you knew what to do so that all of America knew whether the police officer got it wrong or the or the driver, everyone says, Well, why did the driver do that? Mm -hmm. So I've had concepts, why don't we do this in driver training? Why don't we do these things in school so we have a better chance of success? But I'm gonna I'm going to provoke something. I'm going to provoke something here. And it's not because I want to anger your audience. Um, but I got like probably like 12 listeners. It's okay. That's no, okay. <laughs> but here's the thing is, is I'm going to provoke your audience the same way I would provoke a community that would look at me when I say, what should we do with the fact that I believe that we, we need officers who profile? But make a mistake. They it better not be racially profiled. They need to learn the difference of what that is and how to not disenfranchise people. Yeah. But um, you know, I've studied Michael Brown at first, and here's my takeaways. And it's too long in a podcast. Number one, all the things the community was, were feeling, especially in the black community in Ferguson, there easily is a basis for a sense of um, disenfranchisement and potential injustice. But the DOJ investigation under the Obama administration concluded that hands up, don't shoot did happen the way the national narrative picked it up, but it doesn't change how people feel. The fact is, is Michael Brown died at the hands of an encounter with a police officer after a pretty aggressive struggle. And so on one hand, society looks at that and says, well, the police officer got off. The reality is, is most people don't read the 100 or 200 or 300 page report to understand what they did find is, is a pattern or practice of policing that caused people to not trust the police. 
And so for me as a chief, that's why I always look at and say, if that were to happen here, am I doing best practice to ensure that doesn't happen? Because if something happens across the country, it still affects the way a person feels in that community. Right. So we have to be in this together. Yeah. And uh, we have to suspend our assumptions, not only in the policing side of this, but as society. Right. We have to learn to be better. We have to learn to comply. Yeah. We have to learn how to be more successful yeah. and get to the root issues. And, and I, I, I totally agree that, that that would be a good recipe for 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 better outcome um but even even with the mike the mike brown case and i've i've read it i didn't read all of it but i read a, a lot of it but it, it still goes it went back to that like no matter really what he did he didn't have a gun or or a knife like the to shoot him, it's like the robot. Like, wait, you didn't like that. Like, well, and, and, and to you your, see examples to point, too of a so lot of white people beating the shit yeah. out of cop with gun. gun. And I, yeah. I know it's anecdotal. <laughs> I know it's like anecdotal, but it's well, we're caught up in this buzzword. So let me, yeah. I'll throw this out. So again, we always say suspend your assumptions. Mm -hmm. The word unarmed, and and that's true. I don't think there, there's any evidence to suggest that Michael Brown came on that day and encountered uh, the officer in the middle of the street, um, that he, he was armed with his own firearm. The, the, the evidence, though, th there is evidence, even through the DOJ, the federal investigation under the Holder DOJ administration, was that, that there was a, a struggle over the officer's gun. And, and whether... Um, because they were they were the only ones there, right? right, right. And so there's not there's not going to be all this other evidence, but but to to the degree that factually they can conclude that there that the Michael Brown struggled with the officer mm -hmm. and was struggling for his weapon. Well, this is where I look at the model of how can you back everything up in society and say there's I, I always agree. What could the officer have done different? Mm -hmm. But as a society. What the narrative is and the emotion and the television, the, the media and social media never, ever wants to do is look at and say, can we also help avoid this by the actions of the person that was in this very volatile encounter? And if we aren't willing to say yes on both sides, then what we're doing is, is we're pushing one element of, of hey, our, our justice keepers just you're going to have to get closer to the edge of the ledge of failure and i'll be the first to say police are going to fail because they're human they're imperfect we can make them as good as they possibly can but if, if an officer is put in a situation where they're struggling over their own firearm there's there's likely a very bad encounter that's going to come after that and the narrative doesn't always come out until a year or two later on what the fact is by that time, it's too late. When there's a real opportunity to learn, how could we have been better in that encounter, if anything? What are our takeaways? The same way that they'll dissect a plane crash, we also have to look at the fact that um, in, in encounters where the person clearly was doing dangerous acts, yeah. well, how do we teach young black kids respect for authority starts whether it's in the home or in the classroom and definitely with authority and we can learn to find ways to build relationships to avoid that has to be the goal and we can get there just a quick story we talk about this this uh need last year to to vent and to protest and so put yourself in my shoes i have a city that says please don't come in and destroy our city and it didn't happen here right this happened this happened uh, in Minnesota, but you know we had peaceful demonstrations here, and there was peaceful demonstrations all over the country. But then there's this this buildup of emotion, and I assure you, I, wa I watched it firsthand. And uh, the day after, so it would have been a year ago, on you know on the first, I worked. I put on the uniform that night. Typically, it's kind of like a, a general in the field isn't going to go out, right? You've got people for that. Right. But it was an all-hands-on-deck. And uh, I'll never forget that night because my takeaway was I've never seen so much potential for destruction in my entire life. I mean, we think of a wildfire or we think of an earthquake that are out of our control. 
but there was um, just droves of, of cars that would come in from the Bay Area. They were going all over the Bay Area to somehow exact some form of frustration and revenge through destruction. Mm -hmm. And I get that, and we see that on national narratives. At the end of the day, the, the very next day, it's easy to, to be in a position that says, well, maybe some good will come to it because it brings attention to it. But in my role, I have to protect life and property from being destroyed, and nobody wants their home destroyed or their business destroyed. But on that particular day, we took over 20 guns off the street, carload after carload of people coming in, coming into town. They're not from this area, and it truly did happen, and uh, there was information intelligence that it was going to happen, and who knows where they were coming from. It was just this this frustration, and everybody you know, had weapons to destroy, and a lot of them were armed carload after carload coming in all night long. Well, I was on several of those traffic stops. The takeaway for me is, is nobody wants a place to be destroyed. And I'm always and have always been a person as a leader in the profession, willing to listen, willing to sit down, willing to admit when there's, there needs to be something better and how to improve it. And always, always ready for the call. But I made a, a traffic stop along. I was with a, a young officer, a seasoned officer, a veteran of the military, but also a veteran of somebody that I knew. And I know that you work with at-risk kids. And I have over the years, too, with the Boys and Girls Club or PAL and just trying to invest. Well, this young man, who happens to be a police officer, he was. I was riding with him because they don't give me the keys anymore, <laughs> right? And we pulled over a car. You know, two young kids out of the Bay Area, and they were here following that same, that sense of this, the injustices, and we've got exact revenge. And I took a gun off, off one of the kids, and they were teenagers. And um, we, we arrested them, we cited them, and, and released them to one of the parents from the Bay Area. The driver, who was a young officer of mine, he starts engaging with these kids. And he says, you guys aren't that bad. And I'm looking and watching this divergence of when I started in law enforcement, where, you, where the police officers looking at what you did was bad, you have guns, you want to destroy, you're bad. Mm -hmm. With no, no correlation for human value. That doesn't mean that you can't expect that you can't come in and do that and you can't be armed with this and bad things can happen. But not a single shooting occurred in our town that night. And there was over 20 different cars with guns in the cars. And, uh, and there were some really hairy moments. But good professional experience prevented that from happening. But those two kids, I, I watched them engage in this conversation with this, this officer who I absolutely admire because I watched him grow up in a troubled life running the streets. And I helped him get and his family get him some help when he was incarcerated in juvenile hall. And I even took him to a program because the, the, you know, the parents really wanted, the family really wanted me to help. And I said, you can do anything you want. And his journey after that was he had a past of crime, but he went into the military and thought he could never make anything of his life. And it's just paying it forward because on that day he reached across the middle of the front while the kids are in the back and he put his hand on my shoulders and he told these kids, I hope that someday you meet a man like this who believes in you because you know, you're good kids. Now those kids, you know, they had, they faced gun charges, but ultimately the procedural justice and the systems that are trying to have a stronghold in America, especially with our youth were in place here. With, um, with the ability to say, let's not incarcerate those kids forever. What they did was wrong, mm -hmm. but we don't, let's not lock, lock them up and throw away the key. Let's invest in them. Yeah. So, but that's it. It's life paying it forward and trying to not focus on all the problems of the past and get stuck there, but try to figure out what can we do better. And uh, it's investing in our kids. Are, are there any other good ideas for, for best practice that, that, Police and for uh, law enforcement, society, uh, government. Is it something that we should be um, looking forward to, or do you have any ideas about that? Absolutely. You know, there's always different parts of the criminal justice system, but I'll stay in my lane, which mm -hmm. is how to how to equip police officers. So, 
my focus has been since that uh, that day in the White House to hire, train, and equip emotionally intelligent people. But it's high risk, low occurrence. So you think of these these significant issues, and how do you train someone who's never done it? Versus, imagine you know the your experience out on the football field. You get some brand new person who doesn't know the role, and you you try to get them up to speed. <laughs> Well, you do that through training, and so you practice these drills, but you don't want to teach robots, right? You don't want people to just say, well, this is the only way to do it. So they have to feel it. It has to be experiential. So training has evolved, and I have been focusing on how to take it and making it more realistic. you got to put them in a situation so they're going to evolve in that. The technology is advanced, and so one of the things that I was able to achieve just prior to my retirement was in partnership with the California Post. I shared that with you. And that is is to implement a virtual reality training. The military's been doing it for a while. Gamers love it, right? Mm-hmm. Especially if you're, you're playing sports games or all the different kinds of games. I don't like the shooting up games because it's, it's, a, it's the wrong teaching in society. Yeah. But in law enforcement, imagine putting on a headset that creates the experiential high-risk, low occurrence so that you're able to actually allow an officer to, with very little experience, right? We teach them all the rules and laws and policies, but now we put the headset on them and they're in full gear with all their tools and their ability to communicate. So it isn't just reaching for something. It's how that they can, they can take all the skills of de-escalation, forget about their surroundings because they're looking through these VR uh, goggles. And now they have to be a police officer and the scenarios are real. So my vision is to take that, which Vacaville just received, but there's other cities in California that has. And my vision has been that this is a national vision, that we create national standards with national training expectations. And then what we also do is we train nationally consistently. So the young kid in San Francisco is faced with a young future officer which is very similar to one that might be in Vacaville or somewhere back east. And when something goes horribly wrong, like with, you know, flame of the steel, and that maybe that was something that we could, we can redo like the flight simulator for our pilots. We want our pilots to go through a simulator before they're flying us to Hawaii. Don't we want the same thing for law enforcement? High risk, low occurrence, put the headset on, create the scenario that has gripped the nation dissect it and feed it out nationwide and every law enforcement agency has to sign off on that's how to train that's how to do that car wow. stop that's how to do that in camp. that's fire need that's my that. who needs that who need, hey we need to get this out so whoever need to sign that check to, that's right to, to fund that i mean like that's a great idea it's true prevention yeah for and, sure. it, and it's idea. quality training that can change and shape but we have to also start with making sure that the police officer of the future is one that I described, but then you create that experiential training that is so personal. And if you've never done virtual reality, a lot of people are these days, Mm -hmm. but from a training perspective, I've done it. Mm -hmm. And it is so gripping and so realistic that it's undeniable that you feel like you've done it. Just like pilots do, Mm -hmm. right? Same thing happens for law enforcement. I think that's a key to the future that's got to be funded, but it has to be a national structure that ties in to the officer from you know, 30,000 officers in New York City to some small agency in, in Ohio that may only have five. Right. Because we're a diverse nation. Mm-hmm. That's not going to change, but I believe a structure like that, and you use technology like virtual reality, and it's a game changer. Yes, that's that's, that's an amazing it. idea. Right? That's amazing. We can we can play a little you know, a little <laughs> little Madden football and then we can jump over here right. and imagine the next piece of that is, is imagine every young student who goes through driver training. What does a virtual traffic stop with a police officer look like? Mm-hmm. So that the encounter is now understood. This is what right. you're supposed to do. Right. This is what a police officer is supposed to do. Right. So we create a consistency. Right. That is predictable. Right. So, that so then now, if anybody variation off the path, then it's clear. It's like, that's right. You're supposed to do this, this, and this. That's right. You didn't do it. So you knew she wasn't it. supposed to reach in the glove box <laughs> on that traffic stop. Right. Yeah. Well, imagine if everyone knew that 
the registration's never in the glove box. Mm-hmm. What if we completely rethink the way we do things right. to get to the root of the issue and train not just police, right. but train society? And the technology today will allow us to do it. It's time. That's fire. And, and about the VR, I, I, I've done it. I've done like the plank. I've done the plank. That's it. That changed and, my world. And, and I couldn't and, step off of yeah, it. Yeah, I was like, no. I took my headset off. I was like, no. Nope, I, sw- I, I, I literally, I, sw- <laughs> I was sitting there sweating for like right. five minutes. Yeah. And the guy's like, step off of it. And I said, I know it's not real. I, said, I can't step off I of can't it. I can't do it. <laughs> and when I walked away from that, I knew, and this was before I saw virtual reality training mm-hmm. in law enforcement. I knew that was the future. That is how we're going to take new officers who do not know high risk, low occurrence events, which is very volatile, which we certainly know these deadly encounters with law enforcement or any use of force. But then let's train both sides. Yeah. Right. Let's train everybody. And that would, that would, I I want to do it. I want to do a simulation too. Just let's do it. and, And that way I think people would be able to, to maybe even feel what it feels like to be a cop. That's right. And, you know, some simulations where, you know, it, it's real. You walk up to a car and somebody got a gun and shoot at you. Like, mm-hmm. imagine if we get to experience that too now every time. Like, and we we would, we would get to a little glimpse of it. Obviously, it's not real life, but it's like the plank. Like, it feels. And what, we, what I said before, what I, I believe, like, what we feel is more important than what the actual truth is. And so if we can feel and download those experiences, um, I think we'll be able to, to um, I guess maybe metabolize an experience that we, we we wouldn't otherwise have, and I think that would be uh, that's an amazing idea. Like, who we all have to be part of the solution <laughs> right. because there's enough emotional energy in my career as chief and my entire career to understand where do we need to go from here. And so the emotions are real. Perspective, I, I'll never change the perspective or the perception of a mm-hmm. person. But now let's get down to what are we going to do? Right. What are we going to do? And there are solutions. And I'm, you know, my retirement has freed me up to spend time in giving back to a community, but also giving back to a profession that I think continues to need to be better, but in a way that is completely going to change the way we look at uh, policing in America in a way that, that does increase what we would say is um, um, a procedural justice system that people would respect at the same time it's one that everyone wants to be safe right? everyone wants to be safe yeah. we have to we do we can't ignore that side either but we can have a real conversation and so i'm a solution oriented person and i'm also looking at where are the risks and how do we reduce them yeah, that's a great idea i like that idea VR. I actually got a movie idea about VR, but I can't. I can't share it in here. It's still my idea. Well, that's the whole thing. I talk about my ideas too, but but I have a big picture idea that takes the VR technology. But there needs to be those who are elected, and even at a national level, need to listen to how to do this. And as all too often, they just go to the big cities and say the big city policing. They know how to fix it. But that's not necessarily true. Is it, are, are other law enforcement agencies or cities, whatever states, are are they do they adopt this ideology that you have, or, or is this? You like, know, it's you, it is emerging, and there is a few tech companies that are coming out with the use of VR, mm-hmm. and some are doing it through trying for de-escalation training or crisis intervention training. Right. But they need to be also scenario based, experiential, and so mm-hmm. so. These trains, they've been around for a while, but like you said, nothing can take away how you felt about the plank. Right. So you have to teach people, you have to teach officers, and you have to teach society, well, what did you expect of the officer when they felt afraid? Mm-hmm. And you yourself knew how afraid you felt when you mm-hmm. stood on that plank. Right. And so we teach, we, we have to teach officers not to react out of fear, but to respond out of training but have that realistic experience. They go, well, I, know, I know how to do this. Right. So, and and is it is there any truth to the officers being more afraid when they encounter black people or African American people? You know, that's I hear that a lot. I've heard it over the years. Um, I can tell you my experience. I never felt that way, and so I can't take away that being. Um, 
a perception that gets shared and then as it gets repeated, it becomes the narrative. But I think more often than not, you then have to separate yourself. Were they afraid because of race? Were they afraid because of fear and inexperience? Mm -hmm. And um, I would I would suppose that the greater is likely through fear of inexperience in the situation. In other words, I know it's like to, to encounter somebody with a knife and my life flashes before me. Or a scenario that doesn't go the way it's supposed to. Most traffic stops. I, mean, I can think of so many scenarios, and we have to create these scenarios where it didn't go the way it was supposed to, mm -hmm. and then it ends up in a shooting. Yeah. One in particular, it's like, you shot me. Why'd you shoot me? Well, I was reaching. You asked me to get my license. I was reaching for my license. Well, it wasn't a traffic stop. He pulled up at a gas station where he was pumping gas. And the officer did ask him to get his license. So there's all these mm -hmm. miscommunications right. and miscues. Yeah. You can teach that. Yeah. But you have to have a confident skill level. And so you have to also start with emotionally intelligent people. Yeah. It's a massive recipe mm -hmm. to kind of what I would say is revolutionize policing. But it's not yeah. about replacing it. But it is about a, a more rapid evolution mm -hmm. of reform. And and, and, and uh, like that reform and taking it on, doing it on a more national level, mm -hmm. are there any big time law enforcement agencies that's, that, that want to practice not the VR side, but just the just the hiring of uh, emotional and competent people and, and maybe having a national yeah, or or or, or 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 I'm asking like, what's the argument against it? Like, what's the debate? What's the what's the rebuttal so, side? So the argument against that is that it's kind of like a big ship turns slowly. It's mm -hmm. hard to it's hard to stop the Titanic as right. it's scraping across the iceberg. And so again, it seems like mine. I'm a lot. It's a lot easier for me to affect change that I see as effective. Uh, but when when you're very large or you have systems of hiring in place, well, we have a civil service test and this is what it takes to hire. Well, it may take a while for a very large agency to change the way it hires. Mm -hmm. One of the very first things I did when I came back from D.C. was completely looked at how do we hire? Are we hiring people because of they can bench press and they can run and they can do all these things? Mm -hmm. Or is there a skill set that's hiring because... They know how to solve complex issues. They can communicate in complicated conversations. Mm -hmm. They they understand. Let me start with that right. and weed away the other direction. Right. Versus maybe thirty years ago when I started, it might be hire somebody who used to understand what it meant to fight in war, mm -hmm. and that's really the concept of the guardian versus the warrior. My argument is, you know, if you're if you're truly in a desperate situation, you're fighting for your life. That moment, you need to kind of be that, you know, that warrior. But what we don't want is we don't need a society where policing is nothing but military, right. and that that's a whole other discussion. But mm -hmm. that's really about you know how do we do that? And you start with the core, mm -hmm. find culturally competent young men and women with character, and diversity, and completely revamp from the ground up. Right. What that looks like. That's a, that's an interesting perspective. It's a, it's a big lift, but you know what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I knew that my role in policing was more than just my own community. It's what can I do? And my career eventually, towards the end of my career, came to a call to action do it in my own community, invoke the best practices, mm -hmm. build those relationships, find ways to replicate it. And I, I believe it can be. It's just going to take some time. Yeah. And that VR, is, I, I, I think that's a good idea. Let's do it. It, it, it uh, it would, I think, metabolize instincts. Oh, yes. It would be the ability to metabolize instincts. And, and, and to take it to a football correlation, um, you know, about uh, what you said about uh, actually experiencing it and, and, and how do you get a player, you know, a new player to, to see the, the game, how it's supposed to go, and, you know, to get, to get them up to speed. And uh, a lot of times, in, even in NFL, they want the guy who bench presses a thousand pounds and squats a thousand pounds and runs super fast. But the game is 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 so much more mental. is mental and 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 even now, right? Now I, I coach for uh, college, you know, Lincoln University in Oakland. It's a first year program, uh, and I have to recruit for the first time. And and I've recruited before. I coached at Cal. I had to recruit a little bit, but I, I hate recruiting. 
um, and and all of all of the people in the business that you have to recruit. It's it's, it's it's a necessity. You have to, and you have to be a good recruiter. You know, you look at Alabama. You know, they know how to recruit, and I'm and I kind of take the stance of. I don't, it's hard to look at somebody highlight to tape and tell how they're good. There's too many other variables that I can't factor in. Like, I want to know how they think. That's it. And if, and if they, and if they think in a certain pattern, then they don't necessarily need to run for one and bench a thousand pounds. Like it's, it's a certain, uh, level of skill that are, you know, long as you can have the, the bare minimums, but if you can think like this, then we can beat anybody. That's we right. can beat Alabama because we're going to be in the right position and we understand the way the game operates. So I, I hate recruiting because it's like, all right, this dude is fast and they're okay. Every, when he get here, everybody's going to be fast. When you go play Alabama, everybody can bench 500. Everybody's fast. What are the other intangibles that you can bring? And it's how you think. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of recruiting, but also trying to, how do I get a person to metabolize the instinct? Like understand that this is about to happen. How do I react faster? So if I'm if I run five flat and you run four one, but I'm reacting in real time faster than you, that then, variable affects everything. Then I'm faster than you. That's right. But if you go to the combine and you run a forty faster than me, now you get drafted first round. I get drafted six and I'm still hurt about this. Obviously, I can tell I got some pain. In, in, uh, <laughs> in, in law enforcement has the same issues, and that is the established hiring practices right. look for certain metrics. Mm -hmm. And it's time that they rethink the metrics so that what they're doing is they're getting the person who can do everything that I shared and can critically think. Facts. Facts. All right. Um, reflection. Um, uh, why did you uh, decide to retire now? You know, uh, I stayed an extra year longer than I thought I was. Um, and imagine if uh, you thought you were going to retire in your professional career and all of a sudden the championship game was coming up. And you'd be like, you were made for that. And so even what happened here locally, um, my administration and council going through the pandemic and also going through the civil unrest, they asked me to stay. So I actually stayed longer than I thought I was going to stay. Um, but it was time. Part of part of my role in leadership was also to create succession and to create an environment where people could could take my place. And as they would say, you know, take your finger out of the, out of the glass and the water goes back to the level. My only expectation, hopefully, was that I was going to change the temperature of the place and the community. And I feel that I have. But everyone has to know when it's their time. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew that last year. I knew that this was likely, at least for this community, the last one. And that there would be other opportunities. So it, it just it felt right. And I had achieved everything that I believed that I was going to here. And it's time to pass it on and really take those ideas that we have a chance to talk about today to new heights. Mm -hmm. So, And how has, has Vacaville... Uh, or what? What, are, what? Can you point to some of the biggest changes in Vacaville since the first time um, you know you took the streets as a, as a young officer um, until until now? As, you know, as yeah. an there's so many changes because of how things have changed. I mean, the legalization of marijuana, uh, the changes in the uh, the entire criminal justice system, the the requirement for De-escalation is now a law in California. So it's not like that everywhere. Um, I've been, as a subject matter expert, focusing on that, but putting it into practice in Vacaville. So think of all those things. We have a drone program. We actually can fly drones. Now we have to be responsible because the public has a right to know that we're not necessarily using technology in a, an abusive way. But uh, prior to my retirement, I can think of. Uh, the major scene where we actually flew drones into um, a very high risk environment where tragedy occurred and one drone is flying watching the other drone to safeguard a team an entry team to make sure that nothing happened because a shooting had already occurred so who would have thought we'd be using robots and drones and technology in that sense but really the biggest thing for me is to change the culture in a community to believe uh, in the police and that 
was a, a, a major focus is not to focus on just about you know, the details of crime stats, but to focus on making this place that I call home a better quality of life. Okay. Um, what, what, what will you miss most? People. You don't uh, walk the halls of a police department or be in the community at public events and engage and challenge people to be their best. You go from 100 miles an hour, it's um, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, to a, a moment where your phone doesn't ring. There's not 100 emails waiting for you. At first, you have to get used to it, um, but uh, I don't miss... I don't miss all the meetings. And I don't miss all the you know late hour phone calls. I I absolutely will miss the people. And for me, I called on my staff to do three things: is to be your best, to do your best, and to love people, and not in a corny way. But the the agency itself has to be cohesive like a family. But it, it can't ignore the fact that it's part of a community. And it's not a separation. It's not a us them. So that's the part that I'll miss the most because walking walking downtown or or going into uh, the, down into different businesses and in the community events and uh, being there for them. That's what community policing is. So I'll, I'll miss that the most. But um, it's been a great career. It's just uh, I call this chapter two now. Yeah, for sure. What. Um um, softer question. What What are your top five police movies? Oh, man, I don't know if I can name them all, but, uh, you know, one of them that clearly was a very interesting one that um, once I went into law enforcement, I didn't necessarily watch all police movies because when you're doing it every day, it's, yeah. it's you, you watch enough, you know, football films yeah, yeah. where you're going, like, I've seen enough. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I always looked, I used to really enjoy before I got into law enforcement, you know, Lethal Weapon, it was always a very you know, enjoyable you know, partner. Yeah. Uh, you know, Riggs and Murtaugh. Yeah. Those were fun ones. Um, Serpico. Serpico. I mean, I the, that. that one's actually based on a true story out of New York. And then uh, an older one called Heat. But yeah. Yeah. And some classic, of them, yeah. yeah, classic. I'll tell you the ones I don't like the most. is yeah. the ones that paint law enforcement as, um, you know, um, an imbalance of moral authority, like the police are bad, yeah. because I never felt that way. You know, that's the difference. It's like if there's a movie about it, but there's some really good entertaining ones. Mm -hmm. um, I I, uh, I look back and television shows. Funny thing is, I know everybody watched Cops and mm -hmm. Red Chips. Um, I liked Columbo because I was always a detective. One one of my favorite jobs was being a detective. Yeah. So. Solving solving things through you know investigations was yeah. always fun, but yeah. but uh, and heat was another one. Yeah, yeah, we definitely as a and I, I can't I'm not going to speak for society, but me uh, me personally, I, I definitely have a, a great relationship with my movies and uh, detectives, and I think our society really loves it. Like we, a good detective. Um, you know, murder mystery, find the, mm -hmm. you know, I, and I, I'm on the road a lot, so I listen to podcasts right. and, um, you know, I think we definitely sensationalize that, that, that part of, you know, law enforcement. Um, and I, I, I think your, your wife was telling me, um, about, you know, a time that you were a detective and you helped solve the case. Um, I know we probably over in time, but, um, I, I would, I, would, I would like for you to tell the people um, if, if you have any, 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 you know, times where you're detective yeah. and you solve the case. Well, there's, you know, there's some that are just ex interesting, exciting times. I mean, I used to work in a task force and uh, doing uh, computer crimes and forensics, which gives me a tech background. And uh, through forensics, being able to identify evidence. Here it is. It's noon. I'm looking at uh, evidence of a homicide on a computer based upon the investigation. And by five o'clock, I'm on a private jet to, to Texas to, mm -hmm. to go recover evidence. But probably the investigation um, that's, that sinks deep into my heart the most is um, 
what society doesn't always see as a police officer, especially a detective of violent crime, is to see some of the worst things that occur and when you know that you can make a difference. And so um, for a period of my career, I, I worked uh, major crimes here in Mackinville and Homicide. And, and uh, the day that I responded to the scene of a, of a brutal homicide um, of a teenage girl, and to uh, to then face the family that had also struggled in in time with their own family issues, and knowing that um, there's a murder on those, and the pressure was on me, and to to know that uh, the family wanted justice and they were going through a lot, but within 24 hours of of this occurring, being able to take a who done it. It's like the show, the first 48 hours. Mm -hmm. The first 48 hours are so imperative to knowing the truth. And um, the father of, of this girl, who I eventually was able to solve the homicide, and he's been in, in incarcerated for over 20 years now. But uh, it was a 14-year-old girl, and all I can think of was my kids you know, looking at that. And, and just taking everything from uh, circumstantial evidence to investigations to interviews to DNA and the whole court process and to watch it all. And to, over the years, um, see the dad throughout town and every once in a while get a hug from him or a phone call thanking me on the anniversary of his daughter's death. That's the things that I'll take with me. And for every one of those, there's dozens of experiences that are heavy. And so the, the baggage that the average police officer carries is huge. But when you know that you, even in the tragedy of someone's life, you can look at them at the end of your career and have them show up at, at your retirement and thank you for your service. And I remember that like I remember like it was yesterday. So, but uh, those are some of the things that I'll, I'll cherish because knowing that you make a difference, and that's where it goes back to the cliche and corny, is you never want to see the tragedy, and we just see too much of it. But to know that you actually, in the worst of a situation, are able to use your very best skills and when all the pressure's on, mm -hmm. and make a difference. But uh, that was it was a very significant uh, event in my life as a. I was much younger as an investigator than I am now, but it's so important that you know, we have police officers in the future that can be dynamic and flexible from how we treat people on the street, but be very good in a system that sometimes really requires advanced technologies and DNA and evidence. There's just so much that goes into it. So I'll, I'll always reflect on the complexity of some of those big cases and go, it was worth it. It was worth it. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Um, last question, wrap it up. All right. Has you for, for a long that's, time. That's probably time for a book or something. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> you should already have them. I don't know. I'm <laughs> looking at my side. That's usually the way the backyard goals. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so what are you looking forward to um, the most in, in retirement? Well, you know, first and foremost, I could say uh, a little bit, a little bit more downtime. Mm. Uh, I suck at golf. My goal is to always make other people I play with look better, <laughs> and I'm really good at that. Um, a lot more time with family. Mm. Uh, I didn't get to take a lot of vacations in my career, but what I tried to do is be present. So I want to use that time more wisely and to be able to travel more and to do those things. But I'm too young to do nothing. And uh, I don't need to recreate what I've done. What I really do believe is using uh, the skills and the opportunities that I've uh, been blessed with. I've been blessed in my life, but to pay it forward, both in this community, but in the profession and as society as a whole. So I still have grand ideas on yeah. how, to, how to make things better. Nice. So, so I asked you, what are you looking forward to most in retirement? But the question I really was trying to ask was, so... Um, do you have a future in politics? <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting question. It's not the first time I've heard that. Um, I will tell you that um, I don't know entirely what the future holds. I know that I have been placed in positions and opportunities in my past to speak up and speak out. 
and to do what is right and wherever that takes me in the future. I'll always be careful and consider what that means because I know that you know life in politics is very significant. But I'm very much in in tune with what is best practice and where does public policy need to go? But that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not the first person to ask me that question. No, you just you got the you got the you got the uh, the flavor of it, but but some of your some of your ideas, I think, I think you'd be a good person to bridge the gap. Well, thank um, you. You know, between between communities, um, yeah. So, you might want to think about that. Um, <laughs> well, I can honestly I'm say, I, I can honestly <laughs> tell you that there's been times where I've gotten a phone call from my brother says, "Hey, how's your day? Good. I just voted for you." Like, well, I don't think that got you anything, but I appreciate your support. <laughs> yeah, no. All right, to wrap it up, I appreciate you. Um, yeah, for 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 coming on and having this conversation. Well, thank you. Uh, Any time, and uh, it's always a pleasure. And. I've always admired your work and I appreciate the work you do working with, with youth and it's something that's been a, uh, a focus in my life as well. So keep up that good work and let's see what we can do together. All right. Sounds good. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Beastie Bitch Podcast. I started this podcast with the hope of sharing stories of my life after the NFL as well as share the stories of all the many amazing and interesting people I've had the pleasure of meeting throughout my career. Thank you to our producer, Sam Lutman of Painless Podcast for making this podcast possible. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast and share it with others. For more information about me and the Desmond Bishop Foundation, check out my website at desmondbishop55.com.